everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Beck. I do radio show on Sirius XM, Monday through Friday uh, mornings. And it is just an incredible pleasure to be involved uh, here in general and specifically to be able to moderate what had to be one of the most anticipated uh, offerings of Equestricon. The people to my right uh, really don't need much introduction, uh, or any, but we'll go ahead and, and do it anyway, and uh, just from Tom Durkin to Larry Colmus, Dave Rodman, and Travis Stone, and we're going to have a fairly informal period here of, of discussion, let uh, each of the uh, announcers talk about their craft and, and about their background, how they got into it, what attracted them, and uh, how they got where they are. We're going to listen to uh, a call from each of them that they selected. I'm uh, going to throw them out uh, some, some questions and see what uh, each of them think uh, in terms of what it's like to be alone, or not sometimes alone, uh, in the booth, and uh, some of the travails uh, of calling a race. And then we'll open up the floor and let uh, you ask questions that uh, uh, have maybe uh, intrigued you about what it's like to call some of the most important moments in racing history. And uh, I, we'll start with Tom Durkin and uh, certainly the, the busiest retired person I know. Yeah. <laughs> Someday I'll retire. I, I, I wake up, up <clears throat> every morning now that I'm retired. I wake up uh, every morning uh, with nothing to do. And by the end of the day, I'm only half done. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, uh, that's why I was never good at math, by the way. <laughs> talk a little bit about the origins and, and the interest. Uh, you know, you're, you and I have talked a, a number of times, and, and some may not be aware of, you know, of your, of your interests uh, in thespian activity. And, uh, of that's, course, that's Pian, not thespian. <laughs> And don't talk, of, talk with a lisp. <laughs> <laughs> talk about what, what drew you into race calling. Uh, early on, I decided I was probably not going to be a jockey. <laughs> and uh, I was always a bit of the class clown. And uh, uh, I grew up in Chicago. We had a wonderful announcer there named Phil George F. Just passed away two years ago. Great guy. And a truly unique race caller. Really fun. Really exciting. And uh, I just started doing my Phil George F. imitation. And then I would have my buddies run around the neighborhood, and they were the horses, and I was Phil George F. And then when I went to college, I'd stand up on top of the bar, and all my drinking buddies would run around the bar. And then it actually got into the point where I was making betting pools, and only I knew who was going to win. <laughs> you got to get through college somehow. And, uh, and then I just got lucky enough uh, to get a job calling at some county fairs up there, and then one thing led to another. Larry Colmus, uh, famously, uh, you, you came up uh, and announced that at some places that uh, are really no longer uh, active, uh, it, it might have felt it at a point that you were, if you arrived, the track was about to close. <laughs> Talk about, <laughs> he'll, he'll, he'll admit that. <laughs> no, he'll admit that readily because uh, whether it's Birmingham or, or well, the, Great Barrington. The first track I ever called a race was Bowie in 1985. I uh, was the backup announcer and yes, it was the last meet they ever had. Uh, but uh, then the next job I got was at the Birmingham Turf Club in Alabama, and that, I thought that place went well. I mean, it lasted a year. So and then they went out of business now. But uh, yeah, I, I, I grew up in Maryland. That's where I got my start. I, I was the uh, assistant track announcer on the Maryland circuit for two years. I, I first started going to the races working for my father, who put in the sound system at Timonium, the Maryland State Fair. Fell in love with racing, knew I wanted to do something. I could not do my father's work because I was mechanically incompetent. So I started watching all these races from around the country. There's no simulcasting back then. That's how old I am. And I would watch races from all these different tracks and hear this guy, Marshall Cassidy, Dave Johnson, all these different announcers. I'm like, man, I'd love to do that. That would be fun. 
And so I started practicing calling races. One day they said, hey, you want to start calling one a day? You're, you're good enough to do it. And Chick Lang, who was running the Maryland tracks, hired me to be the backup announcer. I did it for two years. And then, uh, like Tom said, went on from there. Birmingham, Alabama, Golden Gate Fields for four years, Suffolk Downs, to Monmouth Park, to Gulfstream Park, to Churchill Downs for one year, <laughs> and then picked up uh, the circuit here when uh, Tom retired. And uh, it's been uh, it's kind of in the same place for a long time, then everything started to blend together, and of course all the NBC stuff, so it, it's, been, it's just been awesome. Did you, as a follow-up, did you have an interest that, I mean, at what point did you, did it, did it sort of crystallize for you that you wanted to get up in the booth? I was just, I really enjoyed listening to the different styles and, and thought that there were so, so many different ways of calling races that you would hear, and, and I, I just thought, this and, and the atmosphere of being around the racetrack, I always thought I fit in. Was, I just really enjoyed hanging out with everybody and I just thought it would be something I could try to do and, and a couple of people kind of led me along and said, hey, this is what you need to do. Start calling races into a tape recorder over and over and over, 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 and then you'll get better. And then one day they, I was good enough to try to do it for real and uh, I was 18 years old when I called my first race. I was just a little kid. And uh, in fact, uh, I tell the, I, th I think the, the, cool th the cool story with timing, I called my first race on June 5th, 1985. Uh, it was at Bowie Racetrack. Tiara's Flame was the name of the horse at one, trained by King Leatherberry, ridden by Alberto Delgado. June 6th, 2015, 30 years and one day later, I called American Pharaoh winning the Triple Crown. So uh, that's pretty, pretty cool how that worked out timing-wise. 30 years in one day, I would have never thought that anything like that, when, I, when you first start calling races, you never think you were going to call what I had a chance to call, and I'm sorry you didn't, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it was your choice. <laughs> <laughs> it was your idea. <laughs> yeah, I love you too, Larry. <laughs> well, we were, of course, speculating that you might not have had a chance to call one, or you had chances to call one, and the races didn't come off, but you will get to the Derby win, and uh, we, we all, that was one of the first things that we thought was, was going to be wonderful about Always Dreaming was... Uh, Maybe, maybe Tom didn't get a chance to, to make a, a Triple Crown call, but he might have a chance to own a, a Triple Crown winner. Dave Rodman, for you, uh, and, and we had a wonderful visit uh, at Preakness last year and talked about your career. And uh, you, know, you have, have been an absolute uh, basic stalwart in the Maryland circuit for an extended period now. And, and you know, Larry talks about you know, the, the itinerant nature, and, and it, it is a job that, that can take you from place to place. Tom, you had, uh, we'll go through some of the places, uh, including your harness days. But Dave, you've really, you know, you are the Maryland Jockey Club for so many fans of, of Pimlico, uh, Timonium, and, and Laurel. Yeah, we're very lucky in Maryland that it's basically year-round again. So, uh, you know, Maryland racing back on, on the on the upswing. So, uh, but yeah, I have moved from place to place at, at times. Uh, I want to say thank you, Dad, for bringing me to the track when I was a kid. I think uh, you know our first experience uh, was when our fathers brought us to the track. Uh, he never he's, he didn't live long enough to hear me call a race. So, but. Uh, I, I, you know, that was my first experience going to the track with him at the fairgrounds and the smell of the corned beef back in the day when you walked in the clubhouse. It was like part of the, all the atmosphere that I really kind of fell in love corn with. Corned beef's kind of corn, uh, scented with cigars. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A little bit. That's what smokes it, actually. Right. Um, so that was my racing experience as a young person, but it started in radio right out of high school as a disc jockey uh, on an AM radio station. 
uh, began playing records, went on to work at a major station in New Orleans uh, for several years. And then this little thing called FM took over, and uh, the, the, the AM station kind of changed formats a little bit. I was, I was a little bit kind of disgruntled with the way my career was going, and the, you know, when you're young, you just want to get restless. So started hanging around the track again. Uh, a friend of mine told me that there was an opening coming up at Jefferson Downs. Uh, as I was walking horses around the backstretch there, that the announcer was leaving. Rick Mocklin was going to train horses the next year for a very wealthy family out of Houston. So mm, I asked him if I could go up and practice, which I did. He put me on the roof with the pigeons uh, uh, on the little ledge out there, um, uh, two by sixes, and started calling into a tape recorder. And the first call went something like, they're off. And it's, uh, and then I started to check my parimutuel tickets to make sure I had the right exact, I was gambling at the time. Didn't complete the call. Finally got a couple of calls together, let him critique it, and they put me in one night, the last race on a Thursday um, evening and uh, I called the correct horse all the way around the track, except for the wire. Oh. But <laughs> they gave me the job anyway because they were looking for an announcer and apparently they liked the style or the voice or whatever. And, and that's it. So I started full time that following year, 1981. It was my first year. So that's how I wound up in the booth from radio. <laughs> and and, and from, from Jefferson, uh, uh, track your trip to Baltimore. Uh, Jefferson Downs from 81 to 1985, worked at Louisiana Downs, uh, home of the Super Derby, and uh, mm -hmm. through that booth, a few of us have come through that booth into other venues, including Travis. Uh, and then 1980, uh, 1991, Hansel first Preakness here in Maryland until nine. So it makes 27 now. Wow. <sighs> Preaknesses <laughs> together. Preakness calls. Well, and, so yeah. yeah, so it was uh, basically Louisiana um, at various venues, and during the Louisiana tenure, kind of filled in at Evangeline Downs once in a while, just wherever I could find work. You know, whoever would hire you, just to get the practice. Right. There's always always dealing with circuits and trying mm -hmm. to make things work you know, mm -hmm. time wise. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, the golden days, I think, there, because the early days was I got to call in the summer and hang out and be a degenerate in the winter at the fairgrounds uh, in, in, a, at the, in the old grandstand. We called it the coffin corner because um, no matter what we bet, just put the nail in the coffin. They just, just, <laughs> uh, just uh, our little group in there. But, uh, you know, so uh, it, was, it was great. Uh, New Orleans is a great city, my hometown. So, and a great racing mm -hmm. town. Travis Stone, uh, when, when the mention, uh, as Larry talked about, the, the tape recorder, famously, uh, you, you did similarly and uh, sat on the roof uh, anecdotally at Saratoga, uh, practiced and practiced and practiced. Talk about growing up north of uh, Saratoga and uh, when your interest uh, started to materialize and and your tremendous uh, storyline that uh, takes you uh, to uh, Churchill Downs, uh, ultimately. Sure. I, uh, I grew up in Screen Lake, New York, just an hour up the road. So uh, my mom was actually telling me the other day she has a picture of me in a stroller in the paddock at Saratoga before they put the fences up. You could actually stand around the horses while they saddled. So I fell in love with the game here. We used to come all the time. My dad is a, he's a now retired state police officer. He would save two weeks vacation to, to go to Saratoga for the entire two weeks. And I came with him every single day. Fell in love with the game through Saratoga, just went home and called races. I raced marbles, uh, pretended, pr pretended I was a jockey on my bike. Um, called races off the TV. Then video games came along, called races off video games. Around uh, 19, I think it was 96 or so, I wrote a letter to Tom and I said, hey, here's who I am, I wanna be a race caller, what do I do? And he gave some great advice, still have the letter today. Went to college for communications, went to auctioneer school, and uh, was very fortunate right out of college, uh, a guy named Mark Millet at Louisiana Downs hired me. So my first job was like literally a month and a half after I graduated from school. Um, was there till a few years ago. Went to Monmouth when uh, Larry left Monmouth and started calling it Aqueduct that winter and Churchill Downs that same year. So it was a, a pretty big year for me and been at Churchill ever since. My first race call was uh, with Larry at Suffolk Downs and it was like a Tuesday and uh, it, was, it was awfully cold. I just remember it was very cold. And uh, you stood right next to me and I've never felt so nervous. <laughs> I was so nervous. Um, but uh, it was a lot of fun and, 
and here you we are. You were on your own. I wasn't going to step in. You know, you no, no. <laughs> you might have even been downstairs watching uh, Beavis and Butthead or could something. Could have been. <laughs> <laughs> Likely true. Yeah. So. And here no, we are. I, I remember that we we uh, had a couple of couple of rooms right next to each other at Suffolk Downs with the announcers booth and then the uh, the chart callers room, which is no longer used there. So uh, during that day, Travis was kind of warming up in the chart callers room, and then we were like, "Okay, this is this is your race." And, and I was standing right there at Suffolk when he when he did it, and it's it's been it's been terrific to to watch uh, you know him go from one place to another and and get where he is. It's it's a cool cool thing. So it helps the. Um, I've never met an announcer that's not willing to help. So Larry helped me get started with my first race call. Tom allowed me to call races on the roof at Saratoga. Uh, into a tape recorder and the races I used in my demo for Louisiana Downs. Right. Um, it's, a, it's a good fraternity and a good network and, and everybody's been very helpful and so is a big part of it as well. It's funny that you, the auctioneer school, it just so happens that uh, Kip Elser introduced me to Chris uh, Pratt mm -hmm. uh, last week and he told me about the Indiana, the University of Indiana program that he, that he conducts and uh, I was, I was Amazed, actually. Where, where, where did you go for auctioneering? Uh, Missouri Auction School. And actually, I watched Smarty Jones lose the Belmont uh, while I was at auction school. So um, you went. I, it's like an eight-day program, very intense in terms of vocal training and uh, you know uh, exercises and how to breathe and things to say. Uh, but also a lot of auction math and estate sales and things that I was not interested. I just went for the uh, for, for the, the vocal chance. stuff. Yeah. And um, in fact, probably the be one of the best lessons I was ever taught was. There was an old auctioneer with a cowboy hat and a giant Texas belt buckle. And I get up in front of the room, and it's, it's unnerving. You get in front of everybody, and you have to auctioneer. So, and we all suck, because we're just learning how to do it. Um, and I started up with, I was too high in my register. He goes, wait, wait, stop. He goes, before you get on the microphone, go bing, bong, bing, bong. And he says, that bong is where you want to start talking. So before every big race, I go bing, bong, bing, bong, and then I turn on the mic, so I'm at the right level. <laughs> still, yeah. to this day. <laughs> yeah. Can you still do the chant? If I can get a 25, but I get 30, but I get 35, yeah, I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this brings up, and, and uh, it's interesting that you mentioned you know, a personal, you know, little affectation or, or, or something that, that gets you focused. And um, as it happens, I, I don't know if you remember this, Tom, but uh, near, right at the, the, the last day uh, that you were calling, I, I came upstairs and I just stood in the back. I think it was the seventh race, and uh, and you had a, a, a little bit of a of an enunciation. You know, even at that point, you kind of reading through and and looking at the at the, you know, at the, the names of, of the horses in the upcoming race. Talk about your you know, your preparations and the evolution uh, in terms of the technical you know, prep and, and being prepared? Uh, in terms of, uh, of my voice, technically? Yeah, just have both, the, the, the yeah. voice, uh, the, the, mental, the mental frame, uh, frame of mind, the, uh, the, the habit and practice uh, of, of uh, identification of silks, uh, if, mm -hmm. if that's the method, everybody seems to have their own nuance. Yeah, well, uh, I think everybody just memorizes the silks. You can't really see the saddle pad numbers. And uh, you have to associate the colors of the silks with the name of the horse. Uh, now, it, at the beginning of the day, it only would only take me maybe a minute and a half in, in, in time. It would, you know, I could do it uh, a minute and a half to memorize a 10-horse field. But as the day goes on, you get all these colors and names and mental fatigue. And, and so it's about seven or eight minutes to do that 10th race every day. Uh, there's several ways of doing it. Uh, one is just repetition, repetition. Uh, I had, and, and then, you know, I, I like to read books about stuff I know absolutely nothing about. So, uh, and, and also books I, I find difficult to read. I think it, it makes me a better reader and a better thinker, trying to understand things I don't understand. So I was reading this book about uh, the brain and about habit. And... In it, there was this uh, section about habit. When you have habit, uh, you can, like, for instance, tying your shoe. Okay, well, that's just habit. You just know how to do it. Uh, when you get a certain habit, it, your neural passages actually get wider, and that information can flow through faster. So I tried to make an exact habit 
of how I memorized the horses for each race. So I would look at the uh, horse number one, say his name three times. Look at horse number two, say his name three times. Look at horse number three, say his name three times. Then go back, horse number three, horse number two, horse number one, one, two, three, three, two, one, two, one, three, one, three, two, everything in threes. And it became a habit and it just allowed me in just the later years of my career to, to, uh, to do that. And I just found a lot of, uh, you know, you, you pick stuff up out of nowhere. Like I was reading a book about music and, and it explained the difference between tempo and dynamics and then it used uh, as a, uh, a, Bo a Ravel's bolero and it starts out slowly, bump, 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 and then it changes tone and pitch, bump, 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 and then it gets faster, bump, 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 then it gets louder, bump, 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 and that's how I thought, well, maybe this is the way uh, a race should develop, and so I, uh, I, I use tempo, pitch, and uh, vocal dynamics and volume. It, to follow on that, because I don't want this uh, opportunity to be missed, it, you were credited for basically uh, turning technical race calls into a story and and into a. Yeah, I, w I wouldn't take credit for that, but what I, when I first started out, uh, a lot of the announcers at, at that time, not all, but a lot. Uh, it was just, you know, links and margins, links and margins. And, and that was uh, the accepted way to do that at that time. They, uh, tracks did not want their announcers uh, to be showy. Uh, they didn't want them to show so much. They wanted them to be really straight because we're running a gambling house and you're the voice of this gambling house. You are, should be dispassionate. Uh, but it wasn't that way with everybody. Certainly not for Phil George Jeff. So I wanted them to sound more like charts. So instead of looking at that chart where they have the links and margins, I looked at the footnotes in the chart. And when I started out, I just wanted the races to sound more like the footnotes. You know, for instance, so-and-so blacked, so-and-so checked, so-and-so wide, so-and-so hustled, and what have you. So I, I try to make more about the words than the, than the margins. And then that just got, you know, then it got carried away and it was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, for, uh, similarly, the, the, the technical uh, aspects, uh, you know, one of, uh, one of the, uh, the real pleasures, uh, all too briefly, uh, as I started to go to Triple Crown races in particular, was uh, coming to Churchill and uh, watching Luke Krybosh color the, the program with the silks uh, for you. So I, I was one of the, the few guys that did not use crayons and markers. For years and years and years, I, I was always a uh, just rote memory and whatever it took to get the names in. But I, it just, I, I, I tried to do the crayons and the markers, and it just didn't seem to help me. So I'm like, ah, I'm, not, I'm not really going to get into that. But it, that actually changed this year. Uh, I bought a, um, one of those iPad Pros, and they've got this, this app called Notability. In fact, I, if you ever go on Twitter, I tweeted drawing one of uh, the uh, uh, Zayad horses in the, uh, the other day. Uh, it's a program where you could actually like, draw the, the silks of every horse, and I do that right on the iPad, and I've been calling off of that iPad now. And so I, it does help me. No, I think it's because I'm, I'm now 50 and my, my brain has decided it needs a little extra help. But to have, those, to have those colors right in front of me and I try to make it look as, as accurate as possible. And when I see those horses on the track and I look at my program and, I, and I'm able to match those colors, the names seem to pop into my head a lot faster. So it, it, does, it does help. It didn't used to help me, but it does now. I, I think I needed, rather than just basic markings, 
something more accurate, and, uh, and with that iPad Pro, I can do that. So uh, you just didn't want to get your hands all full. Exactly. Of and yeah, I, can, I can't be. I can't have <laughs> at, that at right. the end of the day. Like, <laughs> oh, at the end of the day, yeah, my hands just looked like a, a Jackson Pollock yeah. painting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was just you know, and my girlfriend at the time, she just it drove her nuts. <laughs> I went to the. I went to a gas station. We can tell you. <laughs> I went to a gas station <laughs> after calling one day, and uh, the girl behind the counter goes. Do you color for a living? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I said in a way, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think Luke, Luke used to use crayons. Yeah, uh, I use the marks a lot. It's the actual Crayola ones with yeah. the you know water based whatever. But the, we're getting very technical. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, how about you in terms of in terms of memory exercises or or the the efficiency of of being able to. Uh, in, a, in in short order, mm -hmm. do you do it only uh, the day of, or uh, are you the night before? How 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 much prepped in that regard? Uh, well, as far as the colors go, it's the day of, and I'm a I'm a Crayola marker guy, marking the silks on the actual paper program. Um, and maybe I'll try the iPad. That's a pretty good idea and technology. Yeah, it's yeah. fun. But uh, I like it. Wouldn't yeah. be the first time you stole from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, use use a crayon, the Crayola, whatever's um, markers. Um, but it's more out of habit because it's the way that um, Tony Bentley at the fairgrounds used to do Tony it, Bentley. and he learned from Dave Johnson. Um, so it's the way I was brought up. But I'll mark them down. It kind of gives me something to do. I'll look at them on the track, but there's nothing beats actually looking at the jockey silks through the horses when they come on the track, and then also at the farthest point away from your point of view. So, say, into the far turn, mm. if they're warming up around the far turn. Interesting. And especially, like, Preakness, as they warm up, approaching the gate toward the quarter pole, because you want to get one, I try to look for one distinguishing uh, color on a cap, on a sleeve, a blinker, a shadow roll, that even if I only see just the cap, I'll know it's that particular horse, so I can associate the name of the horse uh, with the color. I so. remember one Preakness, we talked about that, that mm -hmm. There were two horses, and we didn't. We both didn't realize it. I was calling it for NBC. You were calling it for the track. We didn't realize it until we actually saw them on the racetrack. How close their colors were, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you have this this scary thought, like, "Oh no, which one is that again?" You know, before the race, and then that's when you have to start looking at equipment and anything that can separate those horses. And it was Mucho Macho Man and someone else, I forget. But was, they were very similar, yeah. yeah. Or, or if it's a 10 horse field for the Preakness, I've managed to, uh, to warm up nine of them perfectly. And couldn't right. find the 10th horse in the track. I He's no behind one of those tents. Yeah, yeah, behind a tent or behind, yeah. behind a pony or yeah, behind a tent or something like that. But Maybe he jumped off and, and participated in that porta potty race they had. <laughs> in, the, in the middle of the infield, they have all these porta potties lined up. There must be 50 of them all in line. And the college students, after they get all liquored up, they jump on top of the porta potties and they sprint across and race against each other. Yeah, we, it's great fun while people are oh, flinging, yeah. while people are throwing cans at them. Oh yeah, of course. Which, which, which adds to the, uh, that was the most, uh, you know, hence the no, no more uh, beer cans. Bring your own beer cans into the. Yeah, I remember calling the. I think it was a Dixie one year, you did it, and uh, they went around the far turn, and all I saw was silver cans going <laughs> back and forth. But they, they were the, the sun was flashing, and reflecting off of beer cans and silver cans, and it was very distracting. And it was only going to be a matter of time before one hit. Uh, a horse or a rider. But, uh, well, how about that time? Remember the, uh, in the Preakness when the guy ran out on the track? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And tried Artax. to punch a fleet. Uh, Artax. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, Preakness, and the crowd in the Preakness is ridiculous. I mean, and they, they've got, they've calmed it down a little, but the infield there is totally out of hand. And the kids get in there and they start wheeling in half barrels at six o'clock in the morning when they open up the gates. So come time for the Preakness run, you know, at six o'clock, they are really tuned up. So on the undercard, Artex, who was, I think he wound up being a sprint champion, this knucklehead from the infield, they're coming down the stretch and he runs out onto the track and tried to punch Artex in the face. Yeah. And luckily, nothing happened except the guy had to go to jail, I hope. But oh, Michael yeah. Shea, I, I have a, I have a Michael, line. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. it ever happens again, I have a line for that now. And that know, is? There's a lunatic on the track! Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the venue of pre-planning race calls, which we'll probably get into in a moment. <laughs> 
<laughs> the crab is. <laughs> there was also there was also a Nerf. I forget which one, but there was also a Nerf football that that sailed onto the onto the track uh, on the far turn somewhere. I, yeah, but I didn't see that. Yeah. Well, we'll I talk when, when we talk when we talk <laughs> Fleet Alex uh, because I, I I've got a unique uh, when the time comes uh, for your race call that you've picked out and we'll talk about a Fleet Alex and and being and being in the infield with, which I was and and uh, how, how remarkable the whole thing was. Uh, Travis, and we're going to start to listen to the calls. And so for for you, talk about your technical preparation and, and what you know what habit and, and practice you engage in. I, I do the, probably the same thing uh, these guys do too. I call the silks on the program and, and memorize them and use that as a, as a guide and a cheat sheet in the race if something's not coming to mind. Um, but it, it goes beyond that. You talk about markings on horses. Uh, I'll give you a story like uh, My Man Salmon Exaggerator in the Derby. Uh, we talked about this yeah. that year. They come onto the track and one's teal and one's green, but they look exactly alike. Uh, it was a little unnerving. And uh, they're on the far turn and one of them is making a move. And the way Churchill is in the sun of the Derby, they're, they're sort of almost washed out, very bright from the sun. And the only way I was able to figure out that it was exaggerator was because I recognized the way Kent DeSormo sits in the saddle. So you learn how jockeys um, look, how they ride, things they do, and you can use that as a little bit of a guide as well, in addition to having the colors memorized and horse markings and uh, some prayer. Hmm. A lot of prayer. Yeah. How about the, uh, the white colors, Tom? <laughs> no, do we have to go there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, Tom had one of the hardest derbies ever. Yeah, I screwed it up. Yeah, let's go. Let's go right there. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. That's not what I was getting at. The name of the horse was Mind That Bird. And uh, I did not see him until very late in the call. He was a, a hopeless 50 to 1 long shot. And Windstar Farm had five horses in that race. Uh, and their silks are white cap, white silk. There you go. That's it. And so, you know, you, you, you fret about this, as Larry well knows, uh, before the Derby, about, uh, you know, how you can possibly screw up. And, and I've got five horses that have got the same silks. But in those cases, they put a different color hat on the horse. Uh, one might be white, one might be green, one might be black, one might be white and black, or whatever. So I called up the uh, director of racing there at uh, Churchill Downs. I really don't want to mention him by name, Donnie Richardson. I was going to say. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, look, you know, uh, you know we're going to have five horses. It's a 20-horse field. One in every four horses in this race are going to have the same silks. So can you just tell me ahead of time which horse is going to carry which color cap? And he goes, they're, they're going to carry the same color cap. I said, well, how are you going to tell the difference? Not only me, but, you know, the 20 million people watching on TV. Man pays his money. going to put his horse in a derby. You got the right to have his silks. And I said, well, that's not how it happens. He goes, yes, it is. It's how it happens at Churchill Downs. And so he sent all five of them out. And he said, but and I said, could he at least talk to the owner? He says, sure. You know. So call him back in a couple days. Nope, can't do it. All right. So I'm concentrating. I know I'm just concentrating on where those horses are. I've got to keep, there's little subtle differences of marking on a horse's face and whatever. But when you get 20 of them in there, they're, you can't see everything. And uh, anyway, so I spent the entire call trying to figure out where each of those Windstar horses were. And my binoculars were just going like this, and I was talking and whatever. And when I was over here looking for one and back there looking for one, mind that Burton Calvin Burrell uh, come up the inside, and I got him, you know, after he got the lead. And... Uh, it was a bad call, uh, which is not good when 20 million people are listening and it's going to be on TV and it's going to be on your tombstone. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, the next year, sure enough, Windstar's got a couple in there again. So I, I said, you know what, I'll, I'm going to do a little end around. And I called up Dave uh, Kastner, Bill Kastner, Dave Bill Kastner. Kastner. Bill, Bill Kastner. Yeah. And uh, he's the owner. And I said, Bill, you know, I know it couldn't happen last year, but you know, could you help me out? He goes, sure, what? You know, I go, can you put different colored caps on each of the horses? He goes, sure, why not? I said, well, they called you last year, and, and you said no. And he goes, they never called me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Thanks a lot. And so, uh, yeah, so, the, yeah, when you get them, when you get doubles, fine, triples, quadruples, quintuplets, wearing the same silks mm. in a 20-horse field, it's like you're screwed. Mm. And well, because not, to mention, not to mention the mud that, was, that, that is obscuring. Well, there's that. You deal yeah. with it, yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, based based on that, Travis and I mm -hmm. spend the entire Derby week, half the week, on the phone with the owners of multiple horses to try to get them to do that. And gen generally, they're this yeah, year in course. particular, they were very helpful. Sometimes yeah. they're not. Yeah. Larry and Travis have been proactive about that, and the Preakness too. Yeah. We had a couple of uh, a couple of yeah. similar. Calumet things. was Calumet terrific. Calumet they were so. terrific about it. So yeah, so they just put different caps on them. No big deal. <laughs>